Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be talking about changing rivers. And I'm going to be talking about your rivers, our rivers. And my title is deliberately ambiguous, because rivers change naturally, they're dynamic, but we also have the power to change rivers, and we can change them in positive and negative ways. Now, this beautiful image behind me um, is the River Mersey, downstream from here, in 1840, early Victorian era. I grew up in Warrington, uh, which is shown uh, just on the left of that map there. There was a problem at this time because the River Mersey wasn't particularly easy for navigation, and there were all sorts of strategies proposed to solve that problem. So there was a problem. Even in the, the emergence of the railways, people tried to improve navigation on the Mersey. So the red lines on here show all those beautiful meanders and proposals to chop them off and to straighten them and to deepen the channel, to make it easier for navigation. There was a rather radical solution to that proposed at the last decade of the, of the century, at the end of the Victorian era, with the construction of the Manchester Ship Canal. So this was seen as a very positive change uh, to the river environment in this part of the world at that time. And this beautiful image here shows the Mersey going through on the right, the old channel of the Mersey, and the Ship Canal cutting right through uh, Lancashire and Cheshire on its way to the Mersey estuary uh, just south of Liverpool. So there were a series of problems identified and a series of strategies and remedies. Now, Perhaps some of the problems you are most familiar with are the pollution associated with our rivers. Now, one of the things that I've become interested in working in rivers in different parts of the world is the rivers closer to home in Manchester, in that we can view these rivers um, as they tell the history of the city and the history of the region. And Manchester, the driving force of the Industrial Revolution, the rivers actually tell part of that story. It's a very important story that hasn't really been heard um, to any great extent up to this point. This is a beautiful image uh, by Arthur William Fitzwilliam Tate of the Mersey in Stockport, but it could be any of the rivers in this area. It could have been the Irwell in the city centre of Manchester, could have been, some of the, could have been the Roch or the, or the Tong or whatever. But it shows a dirty, stinking, vile river, okay, that's been pumped with liquid pollutants from both banks. There's huge amounts of solid debris being de deposited on the side of the river channels. And that was the strategy. Everything was dumped in the river, you waited for the next flood, and all that material would then be flushed downstream, rather like a giant toilet, and it became somebody else's problem. So this was the Mersey in 1848, and it was pretty typical of the river systems in the Greater Manchester region. What's remarkable is nothing really changed very much for the next 140, 150 years or so. We lived with those heavily contaminated, heavily polluted rivers in this part of the world, in another part of the world as well. But the Mersey was famous when I was growing up for being one of the dirtiest rivers in Europe. Okay, so, and the real impetus for change came from Michael Heseltine and other people in the 1980s, following the riots in Liverpool. And the transformation of the, of the environment was seen as a major way of reinvigorating the economy and transforming sort of Dockland and Riverside environments. So Michael Heseltine was a real driving force. There's a nice quote on here. He said, Today the river is an affront to the standards a civilised society should demand of its environment. Untreated sewage, pollutants, noxious discharges all contribute to water conditions and environmental standards that are perhaps the single most deplorable feature of this critical part of England. He was talking about Merseyside, but that applied to the whole of the catchment upstream, right back up to Manchester. So things hadn't changed very much for a very, very long period of time. Well, this was a major impetus for change, and over the next two decades, the situation was transformed. Uh, the water companies started reducing the amount of sewage coming into the river systems. There were tighter regulations on pollution, etc. And an organisation called the Mersey Basin Campaign, which had its headquarters in Manchester, brought together all a variety of interest groups and volunteers and coordinated a lot of activities which focused people's attention on their rivers and the value of the ecologically improving, improving their river environments. And over those decades, in the 1980s and 90s, kingfishers returned, fish returned. There's a lovely photograph here which shows seals swim up the Mersey estuary now to Warrington to eat pike. The fishermen don't like this, but it's an indication of a very positive change to these river environments. And the Mersey Basin campaign was nominated for, and it won the International Rivers Prize in 1999. And that was a real key moment indicated there'd been a major transformation in the status of these rivers and the way that people had started to, to value them. And it said, today the Mersey and its tributaries are cleaner than any time since the end of the Industrial Revolution. Water quality has improved and fish have returned to formerly polluted stretches of the river. So that's where we were the very end of the last century, if you like. 
Now, what I want to do now is tell you about some recent research that we've done in the Department of Geography at the University of Manchester, just next door, which has shone a light on a new problem. And this has generated a huge amount of media interest, uh, literally over the last few weeks. This was a feature in the Telegraph uh, in the middle of March. Uh, very striking headline, The Dirty Truth About Britain's Rivers. So we started a new research project. Uh, this is one of my PhD research students here on the right in the waders. That's Rachel Hurley and Phoebe Bridges, another geography student. We started a sampling problem focusing on the sediments stored on the riverbeds of the river systems around this region. And we were looking at some of the contaminants that were stored on the river sediments, on the bed of the channels. The water there looks has good ecological status, the water quality is good, the local environment looks to be um, diverse, doesn't look to be any major problems. But what we found when we started looking at the sediments on the bed of the rivers is they were full of microplastics across the region. These are spherical synthetic microbeads that we recovered from the bed of the River Mersey at Ermston from that previous site. So we decided to do a large scale survey. Um, and this map here, uh, we published this in Nature Geoscience, Rachel Hurley and my colleague James Rothwell. We published this just a couple of months ago. And this has had an enormous impact um, in terms of the concern about the state of British rivers and more widely, and also has been part of this wave of recognition uh, and that we need to do more about plastic in the environment. So you recognise some of the river systems on here. You'll see Manchester city centre in the middle. Uh, we've got the River Mersey to the south, which flows through Stockport, and you've got the rivers of the Roch and the Tong and the Crowell, etc. These are your rivers. These are our rivers of the region. And we sampled 10 rivers, 40 sites, and we looked at the microplastic concentrations on the bed of those rivers. And what was amazing about this project, we found microplastics everywhere. Everywhere there were people, we found microplastics on the riverbeds. And when you get down into the suburbs, into the city, when we have industry and high concentrations of people, we found extraordinarily high concentrations of microplastics. And we don't take any pride in this, but one of these sites here on the River Tame near Denton, you may have seen it, had a lot of publicity. It has the highest concentration of microplastics recorded in any aquatic system anywhere in the world. So, uh, we have a problem. Uh, our rivers are contaminated with microplastics. So... We also had an opportunity that in the winter of 1516, there were big floods in this area. The river Irwell had the largest flood ever recorded in the last 60 years. So Rachel and I had a conversation, said so we're going to have to go out now, Rachel, and resample all those sites and measure them again, because maybe those microplastics have been flushed downstream. Let's see what's happened to the concentrations. So you'll notice all the most the vast majority of the red circles on the right-hand side have got smaller. So that sustained period of flooding in the winter of 1516 flushed 70% of the microplastics uh, from those river channel beds. 43 billion particles were flushed downstream through the system. So we found that river systems are actually quite effective at cleaning themselves. The rivers can flush the microplastics from the channel beds during reasonable sized flood events and wash those materials downstream. So, three things that came out of this. Microplastics were pervasive. We found them everywhere, even in the rural headwater reaches. Down in the cities, down in the towns and the suburbs, the microplastic concentrations are very high indeed. We looked at microbeads. We looked at microfibers. We also looked at microplastic fragments. And now we're trying to tackle the problem and work out what the dominant sources of those materials are. How many of you have a washing machine? Okay. How many of you wear synthetic clothes? Okay, this is a problem for all of us. We're all generating microplastics. They're all finding their way into the drainage systems. Many of them are finding their way into the river systems. How many of you have used personal care products that contain microbeads? Go home and check. The Michael Gove banned microbeads and personal care products from January of this year. But I bet many of you have still got things in your bathrooms, in the back of your bathroom cabinets that contain microbeads. You could have a single shower uh, using uh, gels or exfoliants that contain microbeads, and you can put a single shower can, can release thousands of microbeads, synthetic microbeads, into the drainage system. So, what does all this mean? Well, this is the city centre of Manchester and Salford. You've got the River Irwell there, circling down into the uh, into Salford Keys. These are the rivers that we sampled, and all the headwater streams. So, solving this is a fundamentally geographical problem. We have to work out what the sources are, and we have to tackle the sources at source. 
we also have to reduce the amount of microplastics that we use. Now, this piece of research is the largest scale study of a freshwater environment ever conducted. Most of the research on microplastics up to this point has focused very much on the oceans, it's focused very much on the marine environment. What this research has demonstrated is that the main supplier of microplastics to the oceans are river systems, and particularly river systems draining urban environments where people live and where we have industry. So we're all part of the problem. River systems are the main supplier of microplastics to the oceans. So this paper has changed the agenda. It's got people thinking about river systems and thinking about their contribution. So if we want to solve the problem of microplastics in the oceans, we have to keep microplastics out of rivers. We have to change the way we behave, we have to change our regulations, we have to change the way we monitor, and we have to change the things that we do in our homes. Okay, thank you.